Have you ever got the feeling you weren't sufficiently rewarded for working hard? Why do you think that is? The economic system we live under demands hard work, but it doesn't always compensate it. Instead, it promises you the opportunity to get rich. Even the poorest people, they say, can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, leave poverty on the ground below them, and soar into the heavens of wealth and the freedom that comes with it. Where does this argument come from? We've seen it used over and over in any situation where people want to blame the poor and oppressed for their problems instead of the system they live under. If you don't know what's wrong with telling the poor to stop being poor, don't worry, you're in the right place. Because I'm going to explain. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel for the narcoleptic insomniac. Today's video is brought to you by Same Taste. If you're looking for a generic food delivery service that your favorite YouTubers can make money off, check out Same Taste, the food service for people who've tried everything else and now have no more taste buds. Let's start by looking at how everyone uses the boot expression incorrectly and why. When people today, especially people who want you to work, and we'll come back to them, use the idiom pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, they mean to imply anyone can get out of poverty and presumably any other oppressive situation by their own hard work as opposed to needing help. It assumes the economic system is full of opportunities waiting for any and all hard workers to come along and grab, and your big break is pretty much inevitable if you really want it. But that's not what it means. It's ironic this metaphor is so widely used to represent the American dream of social and economic mobility through self-reliance, since the action required, you know, pulling yourself up by pulling your shoes up, is physically impossible. When it was first used in the 19th century, the saying made more sense. It described an absurd, impossible feat. Though people who use the phrase to suggest you can succeed without help are using a phrase that reveals the suggestion is ridiculous. But... By the mid-20th century, bootstrapping had become part of our national narrative, seen not as a miracle, but as the almost inevitable result of hard work. I guess it's not surprising the phrase has lost its meaning. Anything can get twisted to serve power. I've talked a lot about the origins of wealth and poverty on this channel, so check the links in the description for more context. Today we're going to look at how easy it is to fall into poverty, and how hard it is to get out. Because to listen to the bootlick, uh, strappers, you might think nothing has any effect on you or anything you do other than your own work. And your mind, you think for yourself, right? You're not affected by the nonsense you learned in school or in the media or from the government or the people around you. The fact is, all those forces have huge effects on you, most of which are invisible. They linger in your mind and whisper in your ear, telling you to apportion respect based on net worth, discriminate against people you don't know anything about, and approve of harsh punishments for people you'll never meet. Fortunately, you can identify those voices and the values they try to inculcate, assess them for yourself, and unlearn. But what we learn to believe and take for granted obscures the observable truth. The first thing to unlearn is the assumption that poverty is a character flaw, a mere lack of effort, and everyone could get out of poverty if they really wanted to. Only someone who's never experienced poverty would think that. Let's look at what we know from easily accessible data. In Canada, the rich are getting richer, but the poor are getting poorer. Hmm, wonder if there's any causal relationship between those two developments that I talk about in those links in the description. The wealth gap is widening faster than ever. For most of us, that means you have farther to go to get to where you want to be. But I'm sure whatever country you live in is different. Let's see how Americans are doing. Oh, the same. A historic increase in negative net worth. That doesn't sound good. 
We get told to diversify our assets, but only the upper 20% can afford to do that. Surely it doesn't matter what color you are, though, right? Racism is over, I heard. Hmm, guess not. Is there a history we could learn about this, possibly told by a respected figure in under 60 seconds that could explain the racial wealth gap? America freed the slaves in 19, I mean 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate, and therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. Martin probably heard the bootstraps argument used against black Americans all the time. Black people have had several generations since slavery to free themselves, and for some reason that only the most basic knowledge of history could explain, black people still experience poverty and oppression. So thanks to the weight of history on racist institutions, black, Latino, and other people are still way less likely to own their own homes. Must be tough to put that million dollar idea into practice if you're still trying to make rent every month. In fact, you might have to take on debt just to have a home. Certainly that would help explain why homelessness is at record highs. Can you pull yourself up when you had to sell the straps for food? But what if you have a job and a place to stay? Surely you shouldn't be poor anymore. Unless you're making minimum or low wages, which in many places doesn't even cover the costs of rent and food. And yet the work is often long, hard, and unfulfilling, so it sucks up too much of your time and energy for you to be able to get another job. To compound it all, in the US and other places, unless you have a union, you might not have health insurance. So one trip to the hospital could wipe you out and throw you into debt. Like these millions of people. How do you get out of that? At a low wage, you won't. And there are other kinds of debt that'll weigh you down for years, like student loan debt. Remember the loans you took out when you were 18 because you were assured you'd get a good job thanks to your degree that all employers are clamoring for? Remember how you were lied into debt? It's the same thing they tell post-colonial states. Take out these loans, use them to invest, and before you know it, you'll be swimming in money. Trust me, bro. It's taking a huge bet on your future, and the people selling it to you assure you the odds are in your favor, not theirs. While researching this topic, I realized I had been imagining everyone with student loan debt as young, but I found out how wrong I was when I saw the graphs divided by age. Figures keep changing, but what struck me was the fact that people over 60 owe billions in student loan debt. Turns out your education doesn't help you pay off the loans. It just traps you in debt your whole life. But you don't need health problems or outstanding debt to get poorer. It's actually really expensive just being poor. They hit you while you're down. You might live in a food desert where stores can charge huge markups. If you have enough money in a place to put it, you can buy in bulk, which saves you money. But if you can't afford to buy in bulk, you have to spend more over time for the same stuff. Likewise, the cheaper shoes, clothes, furniture, and so on wear out faster, so you pay through the nose in the long term. Negative bank balance? Pay a fee. Late on your bills? Pay a fee. If you get fined and you can't pay, what do they do? They fine you. If you don't have insurance, any accident or health problem costs you an arm and a leg. So maybe you don't go to the doctor. So you have problems that go untreated that, you guessed it, cost you more in the long run. Even taxes cost you more 
when you're poor. Do you have any other examples of the exorbitant costs of being poor? What's more, the price of just being alive keeps rising. Inflation's not just in food or gas. It's rent, it's utilities, it's clothing, it's electronics. Everything we rely on gets more expensive, and wages do not keep up. Even if you get a raise, when there's inflation in everything, a raise is a slightly larger life preserver to replace the one shrinking around you. How will most people afford to live? If your answer includes the word welfare, you might not realize how inadequate most welfare programs are. First, you might not qualify. There are plenty of exceptions. If you think you can just stroll into an office and get welfare, I'd like some welfare, please. Then you're probably thinking of universal basic income, or UBI. Means-tested welfare programs don't work that way. But even if you qualify, welfare tends not to be enough. Some parts of Europe are the exception, but in most of the world, welfare is a paltry sum. And when was the last time you heard the government announce it was raising welfare allowances, even just to keep up with inflation? 1945? And yet, when have you heard them announce they were cutting welfare? Does it seem like it's every time you turn on the news? You might have heard people say, welfare shouldn't be a job. It should help you pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And I think those people should learn to care about people with less money than them, too. Welfare might be necessary for more than a couple of months for people with disabilities or addictions, physical or mental illness, people too old to work, unemployed people, people in debt. Or maybe they can't work because they've been working, so they have a bad back or bad knees or burns or anxiety or depression or something else that reduces the number of jobs available to a person, sometimes to zero. But I don't take very seriously the tears of people who despair that welfare exists and people are on welfare and they should work for it and they don't deserve it and they're getting too much money. And the reason there's no reason to take them seriously is they say so little about the vastly greater sums of money being taken from them to pay for war, prisons, surveillance, and corporate welfare. You care that Poor people have that money, but not that rich people do? Curious. We learn to reason that hard work leads to deserving. So if people have money, they or maybe their parents must have worked for it, so they deserve it. If that's true, the current distribution of wealth in society must be correct and fair. They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, right? Hey, it's happened before, just rarely. Social conditions, inheritance, racism, and luck are all at least as important factors as hard work. Where you grow up, how much your parents earn, whether your parents were married, play a major role in determining where you'll end up later in life. That's why hardly anyone who grows up in poverty makes it out. When the Pew Economic Mobility Project conducted a survey in 2009, hardly a high point in the history of American capitalism, 39% of respondents said they believed it was common for people born in poverty to become rich. And 71% said that personal attributes like hard work and drive, not the circumstances of a person's birth, are the key determinants of success. Yet Pew's own research has demonstrated that it's exceedingly rare for Americans to go from rags to riches, and that more modest movement from the bottom of the economic ladder isn't common either. In fact, economic mobility is greater in Canada, Denmark, and France than it is in the United States, presumably because they don't have to worry about how to cover medical bills. The wave of Benjamin Franklin biographies that appeared in the rapidly expanding Republic of the early 1800s emphasized the qualities that spoke to aspiring men of business, and fudged the ones that didn't. From the beginning, selling the self-made dream to those who hoped to live it was a lucrative business in itself. In a country where everyone thinks he's bound to be a millionaire, you can make a fortune selling the secret to making that fortune. The way the wealthy tell their stories, they make it sound so easy. They just got a small loan and then worked hard and it 
became a billion dollars. They're self-made, right? Except for all the employees, you know, they only did the work. They didn't do the owning, so they don't deserve the money. Thanks to the self-made myth, 44% of Americans think they might become billionaires one day. Oh, hey, look, nearly half of all Americans are falling deeper in debt. I wonder how many are the same people. 66% of adults surveyed said they saw wealth inequality as a serious problem, but 60% also want to become part of the problem. Or do they think if they had all that money, they'd be a different kind of billionaire? Well, how do you think you would get rich? By ethical means? Not by owning stuff other people need and squeezing every penny out of your workers or customers or nature? All the power to you, then. I just think that if we want to invest in our future, we should build our communities so there are people around to take care of you on the off chance you don't strike oil in your backyard. So why does the myth of the self-made man pulling himself up by his bootstraps persist? You've figured it out by now. The people who spread it own businesses they want you to work for. When that does nothing to keep you out of poverty, they want to blame you for everything that happens to you. We get told we live under a fair system where you're free to do whatever you like. And it's clearly a lie, but if you believe it, you won't blame the people who own everything and make the decisions and just blame yourself. It's genius. It's like stop hitting yourself for adults. But we can question what we hear and unlearn what we've been taught. That's the first step. The second step is finding others and working toward our collective liberation. If you want videos on that, I've got them. So subscribe. See ya.